Here we go. So good morning. And um, this is a picking up on the series we've been doing on Psalms, Tia Lim. And I decided to look at the Psalms that we sing on Friday night. Not all oh, of us, but a series of Psalms that we sing on Friday night on, as part of the Kabbalah Shabbat because they are very beautiful and very different. And just to remind you, Oh, and to inform you, <laughs> for those who, who haven't been involved, is that we primarily, we started looking at the Psalms that might be Psalms for healing or in times of distress. We started this series as part of the um, coronavirus response. And, um, and we, all the, those first Psalms that we looked at all started with, God, I'm in real trouble. And then they moved to the point of, please help me. And then moved to the third stage of, I'm confident you're going to help me because you've always helped us in the past. So they went through that phase, but part of the Psalms that we, that we looked at in the beginning were deep distress. And I decided to begin or to, to resume the series with Psalms that are just Psalms of praise. And when there is a sense of distress or concern, it comes almost as a footnote, and we're going to see that. So I chose this series. I don't know whether we'll do them all. We, we literally um, are going to be racing through the Psalms, these Psalms, to try and do as many as we can. If we don't finish them all today, we'll continue next time. But um, let's, I hope everybody has in front of them a copy of the Psalms, 95. Um, and I'm gonna ring it, read it, a bit in Hebrew and a bit in English, you would have heard those words as we begin the Friday night singing of Psalms. And there's a very nice, um, nice thought about that because the first word is not bow. It doesn't mean come, it means go, go out. And then we will sing joyously. My translation says come, but the Hebrew says go. And so there is a sense in this psalm of urging us to go outward. And I really like that idea that this, we start our Friday night with not coming inward, but going outward and, and um, proclaiming to the world. Let's sing joyously to the Lord. Let's raise a shout for our rock and deliverer. Let's come into his presence with praise. Let's raise a shout for him in song. And then there is a key word. The key word is K-E-Y word. And the word is key in Hebrew. Because, or that, or for. For the Lord is great. We're going to see that this is a recurrent um, phrase in most of the Psalms we're looking at. And we're going to look at the exception in order to emphasize the rule. That in our Psalms, we say to ourselves, why should we go and praise God? Because, and then in each case, there's a some slight variation on the idea. And this first one is, Ki gadol Hashem, because God is great. He's the great king of all divine beings. His hands are in the depth of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his depth, height. He's the sea, which he made, He's the, and the land, which his hand fashioned. And then we have the bowl, then come. So we had the lechu, go out. And then the come, bow, let's come down and kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. We are his people. He tends the flock in his care. Now, remember the idea of the God, God as tending the flock, God as the shepherd, which we looked at uh, in one of the previous lessons, God as tending the, the flock. We are the flock. And it's a really beautiful thing to think of the shepherd um, around us. It's very personal. And then we get this strange thing. Oh, if you would but heed his charge this day, do not be stubborn as at Merivah, as on the day of Messiah in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test, tried me, though they'd seen my deeds. Forty years I was provoked by that generation. I thought they're a senseless people. They would not know my ways. Concerning them, I swore in anger that they shall never come, El Manuchati, to my resting place. 
Um, one of the beautiful things about uh, those of us who are not so convinced about coincidence, when I chose to do these Psalms, of course, I had not realized that I would be doing it precisely on the Pasha to which this Psalm is referring. The idea that God was really furious with the generation in the desert, really furious with that generation in the desert, and said, they're never going to come to my resting place. But what's beautiful here is that we have said that we can go out and proclaim it. We can come together and sing it because we have been shepherded by God. And our generation, and those of us here, can actually say to his resting place. We've been brought to Jerusalem, which is known as God's resting place. So that first psalm has a great deal in it. Um, before we, we look at the particulars of this psalm, I prepared in the, in the handout some general description, I perhaps should have read this before we even read the first psalm, of this set that we're looking at. And welcome to a couple of people, Rena, Lynn, Melinda, who joined us, um, that um, we may or may not get through this series of psalms that we sing on Friday night. So what I've shown you in the beginning of the handout is that these are a set of Psalms. And I've got a little um, summary of each one, but what I want to read is from Professor Yaakov Licht, um, who says that they, these Psalms, 95 to 100, now he includes 100, which we're not looking at because it's not part of the Friday night um, liturgy, but, um, we can do it with the, with the ones we are looking at. They join together to form a separate group by virtue of three common features, a unified theme. I've already indicated the theme is praise, but we'll look at it more deeply. Several repeated expressions. I've shown you already that we've got the key, but we'll see much more than that. Parallelism in structure of the entire unit of six Psalms because he divides it into pairs. Um, we're going to do it without the pairs, but show a relationship and the conceptual connection. And on the OU introduction to their Kabbalat Shabbat, they um, show us that the reason that there are six Psalms is that it's the six days of the week and then leading to Lahad Odi, which is the seventh, which raises the question, why not go with Yaakov Licht's set of six? Why go to Psalm 29 um, for the sixth psalm and of course psalm 29 will be the next psalm that we look at together um, later um, the malbim writes that psalms 95 to 99 reflect the time of messianic redemption and i want to come back to that he also writes that there'll be two levels of recognition of praise of god at that time the first level of praise will emanate from the world generally and its overall awareness of god's divine power notice the world generally god's divine power strength and sovereignty over the world the second and more profound level of praise will be sung by through the people of israel relating to god as their personal protector and loving king throughout history psalm 95 introduces both styles of of prayer and we're going to um, look at this now. We're back to the beginning of Psalm 95. And um, we've already mentioned, go out, come in. Lechu and uh, phrase a phrases here. And I think that it's really beautiful. I heard a lovely shiur last night about this idea of out and in, going out and coming in. And if we look at Last week's Pasha, we have the idea um, mentioned of Miriam who has to wait outside the camp and she comes back into the camp. And this is a theme in Jewish life, a lot of this idea of going out in order to come back in. And I like to think of this time um, and when we, because when it happened in biblical times, the going out in order to come in, you went out in order to reflect on yourself, you were put outside the camp, to reflect and to improve yourself. And I think we're sort of living this way at the moment. We have an opportunity while we're in bidud or isolation or at least some limitations now to, to be outside the community. Hopefully when we come back in, we come back in strengthened in some way spiritually. 
that the going out is to strengthen the coming in is a reflection of what we've learned. So I like the idea of the who and then bowl in the same psalm. Um, and it says, uh, we're going to raise a shout for him in song. It's something that we've mentioned before in this series and in other series is the power and the importance of song. And I want to just remind you or point out that song in Jewish life can be, and it says, zimrot. Now, a zemer is a tune. It's not a sheer, it's not a song, but the sheer is poetry or the words or the lyrics. But this is the song which refers to the melody. And the, uh, sometimes the real praise is the melody beyond the words. And there are many folk tales in Hasidic literature, which is comparatively modern literature in Jewish life, which refers to the idea of the tune, the melody being even more important than the words. But what we have here is right in the Psalms. I mean, now we're talking about our ancient literature. I think there is a call here to find that praise of God, which is even beyond the words. So raising for singing for God is beyond the words that we're about to say. In fact, all the words we're about to say are a mechanism to bring us to the point that we can really sing. So the, the words themselves are the guide towards the praise, but the praise is beyond the words. That's how we praise God. So we get some words to think. And the first part, the first key, because remember I said key is a key word. Because, why are we singing to God? And the first part is because he's the God of creation, God of all the world, the entire creation. And that takes us through um, verses, verse uh, three, four, particularly, the entire creation. And then we get the bowl. Remember I said we get the lechu, the go out, then we get the bowl in verse six, which is come, bow down. And then we get the second key, Ki hu elokeinu, he is our God, and he cares for his people. So if you see the first key refers to the universal aspect of God. Come praise God because he is the creator of the entire universe. And in fact, perhaps the luchu is a call to, to the entire world to go out and praise God. And now if you think about it, what's go out and praise God? Go out. Go out can be look at the wonders of the universe. Look at creation. It's tied to creation. And when you sing about creation, it, it, again, it's not necessarily in words. We say, wow. The ancients might have said "sela," <laughs> but it's, these are not words that have meaning of themselves. It's being in awe. This is the, the praise is appreciation here of, um, of the world. But when we say bow, when we say come now, it says come and bow down and kneel. Well, when do we, did we bow down and kneel? We bowed down and knelt in the temple and notice that we don't bow down and kneel. Well, actually, when we say the Shemona Esra and the Alena, we do a small bow, but we don't really go down on our knees. We don't do that anymore with some of us do it Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, but it was reserved for the temple because that was when we really came. Remember the last word of the psalm? El Menuchati, to God's resting place. That's where we, we, we fulfilled it. We came. And that, so the coming together in community and God's will, our resting places when we bowed down. But this second part of the psalm is still saying we have to praise God, but it's because God has related to us in some way. And remember I said this psalm is different from the ones we've looked at because any admonition or, or any um, regrets or any sense of anger or despair, any of that is sidelined. But we have here our bad behavior and the punishment that we as a people receive for it, not 
seen as a negative, but actually seen as a positive because God said to those people, he'd never, they'd never come to my resting place. And this psalm is attributed to David, who is in Jerusalem. And he, what he's saying is, look, God, we behaved so badly that you weren't going to let us come to your resting place. And look what's happened. <laughs> You've let us in. We're here. Isn't it, isn't it fantastic? We were stubborn and we behaved badly. So what is the reference? I'm going to read it. We're going to read in the secondary text in a, in a moment a view on this. But it says, that you'd not be as stubborn as this very far and on the day of Messiah in the wilderness. Now, you might remember that the, the waters of, of Merivah, the waters of arguing, um, the story that, that we, we behaved very, very badly in the desert. We've just been reading it. It's fantastic. Last week, this week, we've just been reading about how badly we behaved as, as complainers. And so we had this, the, the waters of Merivah, which is connected it just precedes the story of the spies. We are, we are showing ourselves that we, are, we, we just don't appreciate what we have. And it's because of this attitude that we're going to find ourselves in the desert for 40 years and not able to go on. But um, God says that there are senseless people. They wouldn't know my ways. I swore in anger. They'll never come to my resting place. But it's in the psalm because David in Jerusalem, is able to say, but look, God, you're a shepherd. You brought us here anyway, even though we didn't deserve it. So that's the first Psalm 95. I, I just want to show you what I have in the reading. We won't read it all in detail, but that it's attributed to David, that it's at the opening of Kabbalat Shabbat, it's recited on Shabbat HaGadol. Um, what's interesting, I think, is that on Wednesdays in the Shishal, you know, Wednesday's the only day where you have the psalm of the day is not one psalm. So the first three verses of this are part of the psalm for Wednesday. Okay, the first part is the, the, the positive and the second part is maybe threatening, um, not to be like our ancestors in the wilderness. But remember, David, uh, according to, this is according to David Frankel. He sees this as written later. And um, he sees the two parts of the psalm as distinct. And um, this is a view. So I've included that as a possibility. But um, Rabbi Moshe al-Shish al says, the psalm is addressed to Moses' contemporaries, the generation of the desert, which had forfeited the right to, to the land of Israel. And Moshe consults the people saying, let us praise God since both you and I will be resurrected and come to the land of Israel at that time. So he'd, um, one of the interpretations of this, um, when God is angry at us, it doesn't matter because in the future, we're going to be resurrected in the land. So these are different views. I've, so I want to, to repeat, I've offered you three possible interpretations. The first interpretation is, this is David, and this is, I think, the most common interpretation. This is David. The whole psalm is David. And what he's saying is, I'm, it, isn't it amazing that we're here? This is a psalm of praise because you took care. You were like a shepherd to your people. You brought us here even if we didn't um, deserve it. The second interpretation I offered is that there are actually two parts to the psalm. And the second one was written as an admonition to the, to the um, people in exile in Babylon, who, like the people in the desert, hadn't appreciated their, that they were in, um, going to the promised land, or in, in this case, in the promised land. And because they hadn't appreciated it, they lost that right. Or the third interpretation is that this um, second half of the psalm is actually David reflecting on what Moshe said to the people. And Moshe says to the people, uh, don't worry, because although you yourself are not going to the, to the Holy Land, we will be all resurrected there. So there are three interpretations. I've also brought you R Rashi on, um, on this 40 years bit. That's the bit I want to, um, want to look at with you. I quarreled with them and, and contended with them. He, he makes, he, he points out that the language in verse 10, Abba im shana, 
And then we have this word, I could, I could but do. I, I argued or I was provoked by that generation. That's not the word that we find in the Torah itself. And he points out that this is a word that we find in, in Job and Job is quarreling or striving. And um, I, I, I think it's really interesting that Rashi says, I strove with them for 40 years to kill them in the desert because I said they are of erring heart. What does it mean, I strove with them for 40 years? We're going to see an interpretation in a minute. So I want to come back to that. And uh, land of Israel, Jerusalem, website. Okay. Um, from the OU website, this is the first thing we'll read. Let us go and praise God with joy. I will cry out. The arrival of the Mashiach is met with Shofar Blah. So what is that? What is this being interpreted? One of the interpretations is that all of these Psalms, and this is what I pointed out to you, all of these Psalms are actually looking forward to a messianic age where we're going to go out and praise God with joy because we're going to be restored. This, by the way, ties in with the interpretation of the second uh, part as Moshe addressing the, the people of the, of the generation that we're reading about in this week's parasha, who won't go into the land themselves saying we can still, we'll have an opportunity to praise God because we'll do it at the, in messianic times when we'll be revived. So that is one of the things that, uh, that one of the interpretations of this. I want you to read on page two, the final verses of Psalm 95 take note of the first generation of Israel that traversed the desert for 40 years and did not merit to enter the land. The, the psalmist concludes, Al takshul of Avchem, do not harden your hearts like your fathers, whom I did not let enter the promised land. And this could be, again, it, it, it can be very positive because God is with us. And although there was one generation he didn't let in, he had this striving. Again, look at that, look at that word. 40 years, a kutbado. It sounds to me like a simple reading is God was striving with his decision. He didn't really like it. He would have preferred to let the people in. So um, this is... Uh, these are some interpretations. Now, I, I mentioned already David Frankel. It's a quite a radical and new interpretation, but I still think a very interesting one. And he says that the reference to Masan Nariva may seem to be straightforward to historical events, but maybe they're not. And he gives um, a few examples. Most, suggest in one, most traditional Jewish commentators interpret the reference as the story and the, when the quarrel and they demand water. We've been talking about this and God tests them. But he says, why would we refer to this particular incident in Psalm 95? Because there were plenty more examples. And as I mentioned, we've been seeing them in uh, this week's and last week's parasha um, that a rebellion. So why this particular rebellion? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that um, make my own suggestion now, and maybe it's partly an answer to him, is that the word Masa and Meriva, Meriva is an argument, and Masa is a journey. And maybe those words, which are poetic words, remember this is poetry, and these, these poetic words um, are general. He's generalizing about our argumentativeness and the journey that we took. Anyway, this is suggestion too, is that Samuel Lowenstam, late professor of Bible from Hebrew University, says that the psalm refers to an earlier version of the story of Masal Mirivan, no longer preserved in the Torah. Um, but he dismisses that idea. Um, but I think I still think it's interesting that apparently Masa and Meriva words are linked together in extra biblical ancient texts. So that's that's interesting that they're poetry. Here is suggestion three, which is so relevant to this week's parsha. I suggest that the psalm refers to the spy story. The story speaks of the divine punishment of the wilderness wandering. 
The punishment fits the crime. The people sinfully reject the land. They're not allowed to enter the land. The names Masa and Merivah are a problem since they're associated with the story of water from the rock. But I've mentioned they don't necessarily have to. Uh, Ibn Ezra suggests that it indeed is the story of the spies that we're referring to. And um, I'm going to leave you the rest of this to, to read yourself. But the uh, twinning of Meriva quarrelling, and Massa, which I refer to as journey, but is also testing, is a, a really the idea that arguing and testing are related. We strive with God. We test God, <laughs> push him all the time. And yet this psalm suggests that we are elevated despite all that. So that's what I want to say about Psalm 95 at this point. Um, question? Question? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, two questions. Now, actually, um, they're consistent in the translations, even in the Peshitta text. Uh, just a minute, uh, Netanel, I'm going to stop you because I have four or five psalms to go through. So you're, it sounds to me like you're about to give us an explanation. If you have a question... No, a question. It, it, it's just that, that why are they making this mistake of translating Lafu? Even Cohen the, of the Sultina... Uh, no, no, no. It's not... I, I'm going to suggest to you, again, we have this in other places in the Torah where we have um, an interpretation of come as go or go as come. I'm just blank for the moment. I know it's to do with go, going to Moshe, when Moshe goes to Paro and he's going and it says coming. I'm just, I can't remember exactly. My, my mind is a little bit jelly at the moment. I'm about to teach two classes in a row and maybe I'm not fit for that. But uh, I know that there are other cases in the Torah where we have go and come. And it's a really um, nice thing to think that sometimes going is coming because sometimes when you go to a place, you go there and you meet the divine. So sometimes going is coming. I don't think it's a mistake. I think it's an intentional interpretation of come because we come to sing joyously to God and if we're coming to sing joyously to God, we, there's a sense of coming to God. I pointed out that it's going, that the, the, the literal word is going, because I like also to play with this idea of leaving in order to come in or going outwards. But I don't, it's not a mistake, it's an interpretation. And all translation is interpretation. All translation. I would have, if I were writing my translation, I would have emphasized the go and come. But I recognize this as a legitimate interpretation of the, of the language. Okay, um, so let us take this opportunity now to move to Psalm 96. And you will notice that Psalm 96, seeing that this is a shur in Shir Hadash's Bet Midrash, of course, I like the fact that on Friday night, there are two Shir Hadash Psalms, and there's actually a third Shir Hadash Psalm, which we sing on Shabbat morning. But Shir Hadash, a new song, is, um, is a, a, a lovely idea. And there, we're going to see that the two versions have slightly different, um, different emphases. 96, the one we're going to read first, is the Shir Hadash that let's sing a new song that celebrates God's um, creation and the universal aspects. And Psalm 98 is going to refer to our national or particularist liberation and relationship with God. And both of these new, need a new song. Something I didn't say at the beginning of this is none of these Psalms um, have a, a superscript, which we talked about in the past, um, they don't, they're, they're not Shia Malot or any of those um, superscripts, uh, but one of them has a word, which we'll see in a minute. Okay, so this is the first of the Sing to the Lord, a new song, Shiru Lashem Shir Hadash. I'll read the English again. Sing to the Lord, a new song. Sing to the Lord, all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim 
tell of his glory, um, nation after nation. Now, remember, I mentioned to you that Shia refers to the lyrics, whereas the Zemeh refers to the tune. So this seems to be saying, let's try and find the words. And you get this, and verse three, when it says, Saprulba Goyim, tell, that's another word for, for telling. This is about, let's try and find the words. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wondrous deed, for the Lord is great and much acclaimed. He's held in awe by divine being, by all divine beings. All the gods of the people are mere idols, but the Lord made the heaven. Glory and majesty are upon him, strength and splendor in his temple. And then we get another word, bring, um, ascribe to the Lord, O families, Hashem kavod ba'oz, bring glory and strength, bring, ascribe, the, I, this is the, the word havu, which, which is, uh, Yes, ascribe, it's a good translation to the, 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 the glory of his name, bring tribute um, bow and, um, and uh, bow down to the Lord in his majesty, bring, um, tremble in his presence, declare among the nations, again, imu. So we're getting all these words that are to do with, let's try and find the words, imu. Declare among the nations the Lord is king, the world stands firm, it cannot be shaken. He judges the people with equity. This is interesting, isn't it? He judges the people with equity. We're coming back to that. Let the heavens rejoice and the earth exult. Let the sea and all within it thunder the fields and everything and exult at the presence of the Lord for his coming. He's coming to rule Kiba. He's coming to rule the earth. He will rule the world justly and its people in faithfulness. What we said before regarding the previous psalm, that it refers perhaps to the messianic times, seems to be much clearer in this psalm. This psalm really seems to be talking about a time when all the world will be able to find the words to speak to, to God. All the world will be able to shout, and it won't only be all the people. It will be the trees and the forest and the heavens. Everybody will find the appropriate words to praise God at some, it looks like at some future time. And this, this excitement at the end, he balished Pata Awetz for his coming. And notice that the creation itself is celebrated, but there's one um, value in creation that is celebrated in the psalm, it's picked out, and the word is to do with tzedek. You notice that, that it's, of all the qualities that it could be, tzedek is the one that's picked out. Yadin amim b'mesharim, he'll judge his people with equity, but at the end of it, yishpot tevel b'tzedek, he'll rule with tzedek. So, it, there are many qualities of God, but this is the one that's picked out that will really exemplify the messianic age. So this is a, again a really interesting, um, really interesting choice of what what we can learn and what we can can see as a vision of the future. So it's a very very beautiful psalm calling on us to try and find the right words to praise God. So I'm on page four, Rabbi Simcha Weinberg, and he says these Psalms all discuss the time of final re redemption. It's worth remembering the statement of the prophets, in those days God will not be referred to as the one who took out Israel out of Egypt, but acknowledged as the living God, and he, he refers to this. Um, I'm just jumping. As we approach Shabbat, we transition from our focus and our immediate needs to one of what is the vision for life in this world. We don't speak of the past. We, we speak of what will be. Shabbat is not honoring what happened in the past in creation, but what's the meaning of history. So it, I think it's a, a beautiful way of thinking about this, that why do we, um, why do we, stand in awe on Shabbat of creation, not because it's something that was once done, but because it is something that has meaning. Creation has meaning. And, and that is the, um, 
That's what we think about on Shabbat. Just one comment from Rashi at the top of page five that I want to bring you to your attention. I said that the, even the trees will exalt God. Even nature will find the, the right words. But Rashi reminds us that the forest trees could be a metaphor for the rulers of the nations. So it, maybe it is the humans that find the words. Um, I found this commentary on the psalm from um, Enaya, which is a, um, um, a Kabbalistic text. It says this, there is intellectual beauty and beauty that is beheld by the senses. Intellectual beauty, such as kindness and straightness, good deeds and fine attributes, must be the dominant concern. However, even the less critical physical beauty is to be used as we derive from this is my Lord and I will adorn him in, in Shmot, that one is supposed to spend up to an extra third in price in order to fulfill a mitzvah in a way that's pleasing to the eye. We learn that about Hidu mitzvah. Indeed, the Pasuk says, glory and beauty is before him, strength and grandeur are in his sanctuary. So here the, the, the Kabbalistic text is tying this psalm which speaks in, in many ways of the, of, uh, the glory and beauty of creation um, and that glory and majesty and so on. He says that we learn a lesson from this as to how we approach doing a mitzvah. We try and do it with as much glory and beauty as possible. And I learned from this psalm um, the value that, that I mentioned a moment ago of justice as the vision of the, of the days to come is that God, it will become clear that justice, you see, when we live in this world in normal times, it's not always apparent that justice is being done. And this psalm in the Shir Hadash, that we find new words to praise God, because we will find new words when it becomes apparent what the justice is, the justice that's hidden at the present time and will become apparent in the future time. So before we move on to, to Psalm 97, any comments on, on this one or questions? And you know you can unmute yourself to, to make your comments. Okay, yes, hi. Yes. Hi. Um, you know, I, I just a, a, a mental image came when you talked about you know this hidur Um I don't think I will ever see uh, the people in the shuk examining the etragim again without instead of just thinking of what I normally think about without thinking of this psalm and the necessity of of combining this whole change of chain of, of physical beauty to to this psalm. Thank you. Thank you. That's really lovely. Okay. I know that, that this feels like a bit of a marathon, but I do think it's lovely to read these psalms together as we do on Friday night. And with a good hazan, it doesn't feel like a marathon, um, but <laughs> in fact, it can sometimes feel too long, but uh, we'll do it together now. So I'm turning to Psalm 97, which begins, Hashem Malach, the Lord is King, and then we get this word, tagel ha'aretz, let the earth exult. Now, tagel is a beautiful word. And then, yismechu, yimrabim, may the islands rejoice. We recognize the word yismechu. We recognize that word of, of enjoyment there. But what about tagel ha'aretz? What is tagel? So I want to um, sing that my granddaughter Galia, when her father named her in shul, he gave a, a beautiful drush about this idea of gal and what it might mean. First of all, let's look at the words that we know with tagel or gal in them. We know about a gal being a wave, that we all recognize. We know about um, gal gal being a wheel, that we will know. We've heard the word gila, gila v'simcha, when we sing at a, at a wedding. But what is the difference between the tagel and the, the simcha? Um, I'm not going to go into all the meanings of simcha at the moment, 
because there's, there's many and there, is a, there are many passages written. In fact, a, a couple of years ago at Sheikh Hadash, we did a little mini series on the meaning of joy and simcha. But I just want to focus on the gull for the moment and what's the, the idea of moving and circularity. The gull can refer also to the ma'agal, to the circle. It's got gal at the end of it. And the idea of joy or rejoicing as connected with movement and often circular movement. But the, when we say gila and we refer to tagel, we should think of ourselves as dancing or in movement. It is, it, it's the sort of simcha that encompasses our physical movement and being as well. So this word, as we open Psalm 97, remember what we had in the first, uh, first of the Psalms we read on Friday night? I said, and we talked about the idea that um, we needed to find zimrot or, or tunes or melodies beyond words. And then the second psalm said to us, let's find those words. We need to find the words and we will, there's optimism, we'll find those words in the time to come because when we understand the justice, we'll understand, and, it's, and the justice is apparent to us, we'll find the words. And now in the third of the Psalms we're reading, it says, let's rejoice with our physicality. Um, we've had music or melody, we've had words, and now we've got the tagel, the, the physicality of our rejoicing. And it says, uh, dense clouds around him, righteous and justice are the... Um, are the, uh, at the base of his throne. And I want to point out something to you. Um, I did point it out in the previous psalm, the word ki, ki gadol Adonai, it's already in um, verse four. But in this psalm, look with me, and it doesn't say um, rejoice because God is king. It starts off, God is king, and, we're, and the, the earth rejoice. It's not like, it's not causative. It's just, it all happens. It's all part of the same, our very mode of existence. God is king, we're rejoicing. Let the earth rejoice. And by the way, it's the earth rejoice. We are here, we diminish ourselves to being part of creation. We're rejoicing along with all of creation. Um, and it's not an intellectual process key because we understand something, we're rejoicing. But with the physicality of rejoice is even beyond making cause and effect. And the dense clouds around him, righteousness and justice again, you see, mishpat, the tzedek and mishpat, but we've got the, the mishpat here, righteousness, tzedek or mishpat are at the base of his throne. And then this Fire is his vanguard, will come back burning his foes on every side. His lightnings light up the world. The earth is convulsed at the sight. Mountains melt like wax at God's presence, at the presence of the Lord of the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness. All the people who see his glory, <laughs> or they, all those who worship images, who want their idols, are dismayed. All divine beings bow down to him. And then we get the the um the idea zion hearing it rejoices now, now this is already different and the towns of judah exult because of your judgments laman mishpat chat here laman we've got the laman and we've got the word kiata hashem elyon there's the key for you a supreme being um you oh those who love the lord hate evil he guards the lives of his loyal ones, saying from the hand of the wicked, light is sown for the righteous, radiance for the upright. Oh, righteous rejoice in the name of the Lord and acclaim his holy name. We've had this, this psalm has inverted or not inverted because it's the same um, sequence as Psalm 95, but it's doing it differently. And we can see the difference here. So it starts off with our absolute integration into creation. 
verses one to six is is about human it, it's heaven and earth and humanity integrated and proclaiming god's righteousness just because it is and then we start to get something a little bit i guess intellectual or referring to to the way humans relate because in verse seven it says all those who worship images who want their idols are dismayed what what that means is there's going to be a time when what we've just recognized in the first six verses here people who currently don't recognize it they're going to they currently they they worship images but they're going to see something of the greatness of god it's going to happen that they'll appreciate and if you notice that they they are going to see how even divine beings bow down to god they, they they're going to see something but us we jewish people we are going to hear and rejoice now hearing as we've been talking about um with regards to this week's parasha actually those who were with, with me yesterday we talked about the fact that in this week's parasha we were reminded how our our eyes can deceive us we can see things wrongly we have to train ourselves to see and judaism is usually considered a religion that or a tradition and a culture that focuses on shma listening hearing that sense that because shma enters from the ear or what we hear but it enters into our perception and when we hear we'll rejoice now what are we rejoicing about there are two things it says laman mishpatecha because of your um judgments but it's also related to the previous verse we're going to hear how the idol worshippers are understanding god or, or perceiving god now and we're going to rejoice at that and we're going to rejoice at the fact that god you're supreme over all the beings over everything else and we are, we are um it, it brings us great joy because god looks after us and here we get this lovely word ohave hashem those who love god and what is it they are sanu and they hate or they hate evil loving god is hating evil um it doesn't say loving god and hating other people or loving god and even hating idols it says loving god and hating that which is evil so loving god is also loving goodness is also loving mishpat and tzedek it's loving those positive values and god protects us from the hands of the wicked light is sown or zavua or light is sown for the righteous and here the tzadikim are the human righteous because we've had already in the previous psalm the idea that god is the the basis of tzedek or tzedek is the basis of god righteousness and godliness go together but now we have upright people and the simchut tzadikim are upright people who rejoice in the name of god and proclaim his holy name so this is this idea of the righteousness that we read in the previous psalm is the quality of god and the quality of the messianic age that we are going to best rejoice we have in this psalm it brought down to or tied in to righteous in israel people who love god and um eschew evil are described as righteous themselves it's as if we move from one son to the other that we've inherited some of the divine qualities or we're able to adopt some of the divine qualities by listening through our perception and understanding so that's what i wanted to bring you in my reading but now i want to turn to the to the um to the handout uh, and i can see already we're not going to get through all the psalms 
and we will leave 98 and 99 to our next meeting because we'll just read on 97 at this point on page five. Rav Elchanan Samet, um, whom I've quoted many times from his marvelous set of shiurim on the Psalms, and he says that Psalm 97 and 99 are related, and it is worth us looking that 99 also, remember we said 97 doesn't have any, um, any uh, su superscript, but it begins Hashem Malach. And how does 99 begin? Hashem Malach. God is enthroned. So we see the, that they are a pair of Psalms about the Lord reigns. But they're not based around the key rationale. This is something I pointed out to you. The format of these Psalms is almost certainly the opposite. The Psalms open with a description of God's appearance as king, to which a certain degree parallels the rationale in the other Psalms of praise, the key because he is king, because he rules. But they continue with a description of various audiences who respond in their own to God's appearance. And what are the audiences we've seen here? We saw the heavenly beings, then we saw the who, who, who proclaim God's righteousness. Then we saw the idolaters. And then we saw the Jewish people. So we saw those uh, layers. And he points this out. Rashi. Rashi um, makes historical references. But one of the things that I wanted to point out to you is Rashi sees in this psalm lots and lots of references to what Ezekiel sees. And Ezekiel is one of the most, as you know, one of the most complicated prophets. And Ezekiel is the one that sees these brilliant lights, this Ozorua that we, that we talk about. Um, so what Rashi seems to be saying, because he ascribes, of course, the Psalms to David, is that the prophecies that came from Ezekiel, and there's, there's um, one reference to, to Isaiah, but mostly to Ezekiel, so that these later prophecies David had already seen them and, it, and expressed them in the Psalms, but we didn't understand them as fully until the prophets came along and explained them and put them in their messianic context. So Rashi's take on this Psalm is that David has seen the vision of the prophets, puts it for us in this very, if you like, simple or basic way, but then leaves open lots of questions. And the prophets come along later and help answer some of those questions with their fuller description of messianic uh, days. So that's, Rashi doesn't see the, um, that somebody's copied somebody else's language. And, and this is something that I often say when you, when you see the same prophecies, um, Micha and, and Isaiah are, are, are perfect examples that they see the same prophecy or the same vision of what Jerusalem will be like in the world to come or in times to come. It's not because uh, one has copied the other. It's because both have been given the same revelation. And what Rashi says here is David is given this revelation or this partial revelation of the world to come. And then the later prophets are able to explain it in more, explain it in more detail. So um, this uh, Pam, Pam, you, you may not, I don't know if Pam can hear me yet. Just give me a sec. Uh, Pam, you may not have realized that we started uh, earlier today. So you'll, you'll want to pick this up on the, on the recording because we're right at the end of the lesson. So, um, so what we what um, what we we see here is unexplained. Like this, the light, for example, that's just mentioned here, doesn't become clear to us what it means until we um, until we um, we are revealed it through the the later prophets. So as I say, we, we, we don't have, we've got uh, three minutes left, so I don't want to start another psalm, but I want to give us an opportunity to reflect and comment on what we've heard in these three psalms that we've looked at together today. Um, would anybody like to make a comment? Hannah, unmute yourself. Can you do it? Yes, Yeah, Hannah. hi. Um, yeah, this has been great. Um, 
you brought something to mind looking in the first verse, the word um, tagel, um, when we're talking about um, making circles, which is what we do when we dance at a wedding and when they marched around Jericho. And um, I've read that um, the circling, it actually creates like a sort of a power. Um, I don't know, so maybe it has to do with that. Maybe we'll like, who knows, spontaneously be dancing <laughs> in that way. Just yeah, like I'll, 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 I'll give you a little midrash on that in a moment, but let's show oh. say something else. Oh, oh, did you have um, something to, to comment? Um, I was just going to um, also comment on um, verse two about the cloud and dense darkness, um, which feels like now. <laughs> and um, the shirim that I'm listening to, Kabbalistic, um, they're giving very hopeful messages that the reason that there's so much darkness now is that there's such a huge light coming in. You know, like I would, I picture like a bulldozer. So we should see yeah. it as a good sign. <laughs> I, I, I agree. And I think it's in the sound. Sharon, yeah. Um, just a thought on the word sedek, because of having been raised in the legal setting and being a lawyer myself, I've you know, spent my life examining and dealing with what this means. And I love the progression here of looking at justice being almost a sense of perfect balance. You know, you do tzedakah not out of charity, but to bring the world into balance in terms of possessions and needs. And here you go through a whole series of psalms dealing with the balance and creation, the balance uh, between the various uh, tribes of humanity, the balance within the Jewish people and the balance within the Jewish heart. And um, I think it's a beautiful vector and a beautiful way to go into using Shabbat, not only as a time of rest, but a time of reckoning and how to uh, replace, restore balances. Thank you for saying that. It's beautiful. And it actually ties in with what I, I wanted to respond to Hannah regarding the, the circle. And I apologize to those who've heard this from me before, because I know many of you have, but I, I want to say it again, that there's a beautiful image. Um, I think it's from the Ma'or Vashemesh, one of the uh, great Hasidic writers, who says that in the time to come, the, uh, in the world to come, the time to come, all of those who believe or support God, all of us, will dance in one huge circle with the throne of glory in the center of the circle. And what will be the beautiful thing about this is that we will be able to stand as far apart as we possibly can from those people in our lives whom we like least. The person we like least will be far apart from us. So now I want you to imagine what that means in terms of a circle. If the person whom you like least is as far as possible from you, it means that they are directly opposite you. I can see Simone's indicating it with her, her gestures. It means they're directly opposite you in the circle. And what did I say was in the center of the circle? The throne of glory. You will be looking at the person you liked least in this life, but you'll be looking at them through the prism of the divine vision. And of course, that's transformative. And I think this beautiful idea of all of us dancing in a circle um, but with the what we like least far away from us, with the divine in the in the center, is an absolutely beautiful image. Uh, Janet, I saw that you like like Pam also came in now. Um, we ha had to do this class early because I'm teaching at Limuros in a little while. So today the class was early. You, would you mind unmuting yourselves or signalling? Uh, would you like? in general, to re return to the 11 o'clock time slot, which is the normal time slot? No, you prefer 10. I'm it makes no that. difference to me. I'm, either way is fine for me. Okay, so we will return, we will stay on this. I, I seem to be getting, a, look, you can send me an email if I'm wrong, but the indication I'm getting from the people here is that 10 o'clock is actually better, which is fine yeah. for me as well. So I'll also inform Rabbi Peer that the Monday class will be at 10 o'clock. Um, we're, we're going to continue through June and then we'll decide again um, what we do after that. But for the next three weeks, we'll continue um, at 10 o'clock. Mm. So I apologize to those who didn't realize I did send it. But <laughs> you, know. I think you did. And I, I 
got involved with my grandson doing an online order from Shoe for Soul. That's all awesome. <laughs> yes. doing. That takes an hour. That takes an hour. Play the recording. <laughs>